clear about. Right? So this is a here. Statistics versus is what the definition of a population is. If you're ready for statistics, you probably learned that the uh, definition is something along the lines that the population is all the possible data available to you. And then that a sample is a subset of that data that you actually measure. For engineering purposes, we'll throw that definition of a population out because it's not practical for us to measure every possible value. So the concept of a population is really not that useful to us as engineers. What we will use instead of a population is simply a large body of data. So having access to a large body of data, you can essentially consider that to be your population. If I go to my database, and as I've shown here in the, in the slide 22, the batch viscosity for the plant of years, I've got a good number of data points, about 1,800. Five years worth of operation. That is essentially going to cover all the variability that I expect to see in my process that's of practical importance. So it's a very reasonable statement to say that is essentially my population. Okay, so in engineering practice, in practice, a large body of data with capital N, being the number of samples we can take, can be considered our population. So I'll use this term loosely. Statisticians would have me fired from the university for saying that. One case then would be the number of samples we choose to use. So we may have easy access to capital N, often gigabytes, but then that may be impractical to work on so we'll work with a smaller number. Or you can even have capital N being very small, a thousand data points, but it may be representative of your large larger body of data, and you're certain of that representative uh, nature of that data set, you can go ahead and consider that population. The next slide, 23, refers to what probability is. So again, here a quick recap, we don't spend a lot of time on this. If I have a distribution and an EHOG be normal, so here is a distribution that's very much skewed to the right. So it's got a longer right-hand side tail than a left tail. The distribution there is calculated so that the area under this curve is equal to 1. That's very easy to do. You simply draw a histogram, divide by the number of data points that you have, and then that the area under the curve will equal 1. So the concept then of probability says that if I take any fractions under these curves, that fraction is the probability of this event. Let's, let's give ourselves an x-axis here. If this value is measuring a certain property, say um, percentage conversion, and my data set goes from a low of 60% conversion up to 100% conversion. So most of the time I'm achieving about 70 of achieving, uh, let's say this, this point over here is 65%. The probability of observing a conversion that's 65% or lower is equal to this total area. So that fraction may be 0.15. So the probability of seeing a conversion of 65% or lower is 15. So the probability then is related to the fractions of the area under that curve. So if you took those histograms which were yesterday, you could mark certain regions on that on them. So we drew a histogram of the probability, sorry, a histogram, sorry, of the grades in this course were really easy test. We said it was skewed substantially over here to the to the right. Then the probability of, of achieving a grade of 80% or less, if that was 80, would be that that area relative to the total area of the curve. So this is a concept that's very intuitive and, and you're comfortable with from the previous course. But, uh, let's just emphasize that we're going to use it in some examples later today. And in the, uh, in the Here's uh, again some more theoretical concepts in purple. The parameter, this is a statistic. The parameter is a value that comes from or derived from the population. Whereas the statistic is that same equivalent parameter but derived from sample. So if I took this particular distribution that's up here at the moment, and I consider this point over here, the, the median, the point that, where the data is the most frequent, and if this distribution were from a population, I would then call that median the parameter. It's 
a parameter that describes that distribution. Another parameter that describes the distribution is the amount of spread, sigma, which we'll talk about next. When we referring to parameters, we're, there's the implicit assumption that this is a value that applies on a global level to the entire population, or it's derived from the population. Statistics, on the other hand, are values that are derived from an actual sample that we've taken. So we take a sample from the population, and then whatever we compute from that is called a statistic. So here's, a, here's an example then of that, uh, those two definitions that play for the mean. So the mean is, is a parameter or a statistic that gives a measure of location. So it gives me an idea of where my distribution is centered. So the shift across that axis gives me an idea of location along the x-axis. The population mean is defined as the summation of all possible values divided by capital N. And we, we give that the special uh, Greek letter mu. Or we sometimes use, and you'll see this coming up sometimes in the, in the notes, this curly E, the expectation operator. So it's the expected value of x. It is exactly what it means in mathematics as in English. It's the value that I expect x to be. Knowing nothing else about my data set, the expected value or the mean is the value I would expect to measure. But obviously we know that we're not always going to measure that mean, but it's, it gives an idea of a location of tendency. If I take an actual data set where n is a measurable value or small, smaller number, a subset of capital N, I can then create that same summation then explicitly going from 1 to n and dividing through by n to get my sample. So the mean, we, we say, is a parameter or a statistic, depending on where you calculated it from. However, by itself, it's not that useful. Okay, so to say to someone, the mean of the midterm was 70%, really isn't helpful okay, for, for, for describing how everyone did. What's missing is the idea of the level of spread. Okay, so a mean by itself is, is, should never be reported on its own. We should also report the mean together with an idea of, of, of some spread. Okay, so there's two ways of representing spread that we'll look at next. But the emphasis here is that a mean is not helpful. Similarly, it's not helpful to say the mean income in Hamilton is $30,000. Does everyone in Hamilton earn $30,000? Does, is there a lot of wealthier people? Are there a lot of poorer people? So we need to, part, to provide, together with the mean, some estimate of the, the level of spread. So companies will, will tend to do this. Uh, government agencies tend to do this. They report means of, of many, many a variety of statistics. So the mean pollution, the mean temperature. Um, the mean temperature in Canada isn't all that helpful in information compared to say the mean temperature of another country where there's very little variation in temperature. The, the temperature variances in Canada are obviously far, far greater than in, in many other places of the world. So reporting some other right, other value that goes with that is necessary. So that leads then to spread. And I will use this term variance and spread and standard deviation um, almost interchangeably. Okay, so Variance is the idea that we, or the calculated as follows, let's take a look at it. Um, it takes your actual data points, subtract off the mean, so we, we, we center our data. This, this subtraction here is called centering. I'll, I'll uh, explain that in a minute. So we center our data, we square it, and then we sum, sum it, divide that then by capital A. So that gives us an idea of the measure of spread in the data set. And we call that term sigma squared. Another way to define that is it's the expectation of x minus mu squared. So the expectation operator again, here at play, expectation operator simply says, take whatever is inside those curly braces, sum it up and divide it by n. So here I'm summing up all my x minus mu squareds and then dividing it by n. So expectation operator simply is, and you should be comfortable with this, expectation of whatever is equal to the sum of whatever divided by n. The variance operator 
is defined, this is actually the definition for the variance operator, curly V is defined in that way. So the variance operator is to take whatever quantity you want to compute the variance of, subtract its central tendency, square it, and then compute the expectation of that. So this is a bit of theory um, that, that you probably are already comfortable with. Let's take that now then to the sample. This is the population variance. We call that sigma for the population. The standard deviation or variance for a sample then is simply the x minus x bar, the mean that you calculated, the sample mean, divided through by either n or n minus 1. Okay, so here again, statisticians will have me fired the same divided through by n minus 1 or n. I don't really care. Statisticians care about those details. We don't really, because in our case, n is large. So dividing through by n or n minus 1, not going to be a big deal. The only time this does become important is if you're giving a sample size of 10, 5, 8, 15 observations. Even 15, not a big difference between these, between divided by n or n minus 1. Okay, so let's not make a big deal about that. However, let's, let's be clear on what this is doing, though. This is accounting for the degrees of freedom in the system. The degrees of freedom, then, give us an indication of the number of variables that we've used up, so, or that we have available to us. Here we've got minus one, we've used up a single degree of freedom because we've computed x bar from our data. We've computed one extra new variable, x bar, so we've used up our data and consumed the degree of freedom from that data to do that calculation. We need to calculate x bar ahead of time so that we can complete the rest of this equation. So that degrees of freedom get diminished by one. That's all good and well that we've covered to now. So we've got a measure of, of tendency, of location, and we've got a measure of spread, sigma. But let's take a look at what, we'll, what we should be using and what's more uh, practical. To introduce the, the next two uh, statistics that I'd like to cover, let's just introduce the concept of outline. So these first few slides here in this class today are a lot of definitions. Here's one more to add to the list. An outlier is a point, this is simply my definition for it, there is no agreed on definition. My definition is an outlier is a point which you can notice very quickly as being unusual given the context of the, of the data, of the uh, surrounding data. From the so here's, the, here's a sequence of values, and um, they go there in the high thousands, mid thousands, but here this number 4024 is repeated in this sequence down here. Okay, so 4024 in the first sequence is not unusual at all given the context of the surrounding data. So whatever these numbers might measure, whatever quantity, whatever units they're in, in the second sequence that number 4024 is though an outlier. Here it's not, in the second sequence it is. In the second sequence it is very unusual given the context of the data around it. So again, outliers are one of these concepts that are hard to define, which is why you won't find a, a, a read on definition for it, because it's so, it's so context dependent. Okay? And again, this is also why there's not many software tools for automatic outlier detection that work in every case. People have written many, many different softwares, packages, and, and, and functions to identify outliers, but it will work well in many instances, but it will break down in others. So it's because outliers rely on the context, and context is not something we can code in a computer algorithm very easily. So given that definition, that fairly vague definition for an outlier, let's introduce then the concept of the median. So a median here is a more desirable measure of location. And desirable for the main reason that it's what I would call robust. It's a robust statistic, so it's insensitive to outliers. So just a quick recap then of what a median is, of course, uh, we take a column of data, so various numbers, they're in whatever order I retrieve them from my database. Let's sort those numbers from low to high. Okay, so let's take a concrete example, the grades from uh, 4M, 
for example, I saw they're from low to high, and they would range from 20 to 100, pretty much. So the median is the value that occurs exactly at the midpoint of the data set. And if you've got an even number, we simply average the middle to, if it's an odd number, it's easy to locate the median. So the median is a single value or the average of two values, depending on the, on the number of points in my data set. And we report that as our measure of central tendency. When I say it's a robust statistic, what I mean is it's insensitive to outliers. Okay? So this person that scored 20 in the midterm, the next grade below that might be 65. And then there'll be a 66, and then there could be another 66, etc. And down here there could be a 98, uh, sorry, a 90, and then an 89. But the difference there between that 20 and the next one up 65. If I had to calculate the mean for that column of values, the mean is going to be biased. Which way? To the low side. The mean, the mean is going to be pulled down by that single data point. Okay. So we say the mean is not robust. The mean is very sensitive to outliers. A single value can destroy the value, can destroy the mean uh, interpretation. So coming back to this sequence of values over here, computing the mean for that sequence is going to be extremely biased towards a fairly high value. The mean, I don't know what it is, but if I had to calculate it or if I estimate it from that series, I would say it's going to be a value around about 100. It's not a useful measure of the central tendency of the center of that sequence of values because of that single data point that biased it up. The median, however, is the most robust measure of central tendency you can have. There is no other metric that is more robust than median. And we estimate or, or, or talk about robust statistics in terms of its breakdown. So we say the median has a breakdown of 50%. That means 50% of my data has to be contaminated with outliers and bad quality data before my median breaks down and becomes undefined or useless. Okay, so if I have 49% of my data that's contaminated with outliers or bad quality, my median is still going to be accurate. It's only when it gets to 50% or greater that my median suffers. And you could argue for a data set where you've got 50% or more of your data contaminated, what's the value of that data set to begin with? You would have, you would have noticed that ahead of time. The mean, on the other hand, requires only one bad data point, so we can say the breakdown of the mean is one divided by n. Cent. Okay, so very, very sensitive. So my preference is, and, um, and it's becoming increasingly so for the cross area of data analysis, to use the median and not the mean as a measure of central tendency. And people don't like it. They're resistant to using the median. What are some of the, what, why might you think that people would be averse to using the median? Convention. On average, on average, an average implies a mean rather than a median. Yeah. The other one that I can think of is that people are, are very reluctant to summarize their data by a number. Let's say that mid that mid point there was 70. I'm summarizing all of this data by a single data point, a raw data point from the data set. People are like, well, how can you summarize that data with one number that comes from the data set? That's not right. It doesn't feel like. Right, I should be doing more work to <coughs> summarize this data for you and using all the values. So why am I why am I ignoring all these other data points? Well no, you're not really ignoring them because you've used all these data points to sort them from high low to high. So you have used all the data, you just pick one of them. So that picking one value is kind of something that people don't feel comfortable doing. But it is an extremely fair metric of the mean of this answer of the central tendency. So my suggestion is to use that especially with modern data sets. 
We're very comfortable right now looking at your lab report data set, and you look at your lab report value and you measure the temperature, you measure the, the conversion or um, viscosity, and you look at one value and you say that value is an outlier, and you just delete it and you refit your least squares model. How many of you have done that? Be honest in your lab report. You delete a, a data point, you refit it. Because this outlier is not doing it, it doesn't look right, so it doesn't fit, fit the rest of the trend. You can do that with lab reports because the data set is 50 data points, 100 data points, and that's a big lab report data set. But for modern data sets, you do not have that ability. You're going to retrieve a gigabyte of data from many automated systems these days. You cannot sit and screen a gigabyte of data and look at it in a reasonable time frame. So we're, we're moving to an era where it's not feasible to work manually anymore and look at the thousands of rows in our spreadsheet and screen every value first. Doing so is a waste of time. Doing so and, and, and using the mean puts you at risk of contaminating your estimate and, and getting a, a value from that calculation that's going to be biased either too low or too high. You're not going to get a fair value. Certainly calculate the mean if it makes you feel better, but calculate the median and compare them. If they agree, great. If they disagree, what do you do next? No, if you calculate, oh, uh, if you calculate the mean and the median, and there's a disagreement between them, what does that say about the data set? There's outliers. Or Distribution is skewed, both of those. So if you look at the, the income for people in Hamilton, coming back to that example, the median would be somewhere over here and it's around 30,000 for the city. The mean, on the other hand, would be computed here and it would say 50,000. So the mean is not a fair measure of the central tendency of the data set. It's skewed by these many high income owners that live in the outskirts of the city. So $50,000 is my mean. My median is over here. When my mean is to the right of my median, I know that I've, I've got a long, heavy tail to the right-hand side, and vice versa. So certainly look at the both of them and, and make a judgment. It gives you an immediate idea of the distribution. The next other way to estimate a spread in a robust manner is to use what's called the MAD, the Median Absolute Deviation. It is exactly what the, the term says. We take the median, well, let's, let's take the, it works back to front. Let's take the deviation, the deviation of the raw data subtracted from the median. So there's my deviation, xi minus the median. Take the absolute value, and from the second word, from the, working from right to left, and then take the median of that again, and not the median. So this inner step is a centering step. So we saw the centering idea before, x minus mu. Here we're just replacing mu with a robust measure of, mu, of the central tendency. So center around the robust mean, the median in other words. We take the absolute value because spread is always a positive quantity. Spread, it doesn't make sense to talk about a negative standard deviation. <coughs> so we take the absolute values, and then we compute the median of those again. And that gives me an idea of the spread of the data set in a robust manner. There's a, a multiplicative constant, lowercase c, that we add in front of that. And that's done by convention only so that if x coming in were already normally distributed, the mean, the mad would give you the same standard, uh, same value as the standard deviation would have. Okay, so it's just a correction factor to make the two statistics line up. Beware of this. Some software packages like MATLAB in earlier versions did not use that multiplicative constant. So you got spread values that were off by a factor of 1.5. So you, you always check the help function for the mad um, in Excel or R or whichever tool you're using. So R puts this value of 1.48 in automatically for you. So a MAD 
very, very reliable estimate of the spread of the data, not going to be contaminated by any outliers, especially important in an automated environment. We'll talk about robust statistics again when it comes to least squares. Least squares are another area where you've done in the past, you've, you've built your least squares model, you see a few outliers, you delete them, you refit your least squares model. Wouldn't it be great if you could just build your least squares model, even if there were outliers, and be sure that your slope and intercept were not affected by outliers? So there's tools for that as well. Okay, again, breakdown of the MAD is 50%, and that's because it really, if you look at the formula for it, it's just a function of, of medians, and medians breakdown is 50%. Grad students, 463, uh, read this paper. I always ask questions on it in the, in the tests and exams. 4C3, read the paper, I, I recommend it. It's very easy to read. It's written by one of the most eminent researchers in um, global statistics, but it's written at a tutorial level, so it's very, very approachable and easy to get through. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at uh, the next step at some other basics you can be comfortable with. The first one here is the binary distribution. This is the yes, no distribution, the on off distribution. Um, event A or event B, pass, fail, um, whatever uh, binary system you have. And the probability of both of these discrete events occurring, so these are, are events that occur uh, excluded from each other, the sum of the probabilities of the, the first event plus the probability of the second event occurring sum up to one. So the probability of pass plus the probability of fail equals one. Probability of um, yes, no, etc. adds up to one. So this this becomes useful in sampling and statistical testing, where we say um, if I know my probability of pass is seventy percent, in other words, my probability of failure is thirty percent. What is the probability then of seeing three successive passes? Pass, pass, pass. What's the product of those three? probability of 70 times 70 times 70. So it actually gets to a very small number. The likelihood of seeing three passes in a row is, is in the order of one third. If we want, uh, here's a fairly arbitrary one, pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail, etc. You can, you can do all sorts of tricks like this. But the reason why this is important is to say, well, I've got a system where I know the population pass rate is 70%. Well, how many samples must I take from that system? And if they all pass, so let's just say if I take 10 samples, if they all pass, is that a reasonable sample size? Okay. What is the probability of, the, of taking a sample and finding all 10 actually passing? This becomes important and then is used to derive tables that are used in the sampling industry, uh, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, plants manufacturing, you go to your production line and you take a certain number of samples, it's used to determine the minimum sample size to make a judgment of the population. We won't get into that, those derivations and tables. Uh, they get fairly messy and complicated, but this is the beginning of those derivations, realizing the, the Bernoulli or binary distribution. The next one that's of uh, more, more use to us is the uniform distribution here. Um, we've looked at this before, we've got a sequence of four independent events that could occur, or four equally likely outcomes. The probability distribution for that would be a fairly flat line at the top, and the, the height of those bars should be roughly equal, depending on the sample size. So very small samples, you're going to get a lot of variation. The larger your sample size, the, the more uh, closer those upper limits become to each other. So we're comfortable with, with, those, with, those, with that distribution um, from, from DICE or other examples we've seen in the past. But now let's move on to the more useful distributions that we're going to uh, use frequently in this course. The first one is the normal distribution. And to look at the normal distribution, we must understand the central limit theorem and we must understand the concept of independence. These are two fairly critical assumptions we must, um, must make. So the central limit theorem says that if I take samples from a population and that population has finite variance, then if I compute the average of those samples, that average is going to be normally distributed. So that's a huge mouthful. Let, let's break it down and look at a practical example. So 
A distribution with finite variance. Is there any distribution you know of with infinite variance? No. For our purposes and engineering purposes, never. For mathematicians that work with abstract concepts of statistics and probability, they create distributions with infinite variance. We, there's no such practical thing. I cannot go to my database from any system I've ever seen, take a sample of data, and it has infinite variance. Every system we will deal with will have finite variance, so we will always meet that assumption. But the next assumption we often break as engineers, and this is where we need to be careful. The central limit theorem says I need to take samples from that distribution independently. Okay, so throwing a dice, every throw gets me a value. Every value is independent of the other values that I've got before for a fair dice. We'll look at some concepts of independence next. But let's assume I take these samples independently. I'll talk about how you do that. I take those samples now, I've got lowercase n samples, sum them up, divide through by n to compute the average. That average x bar comes from the normal distribution, is what the central limit theorem says. So that x bar is likely to come from the, x, from the normal distribution, no matter what this distribution is back here. This could be the f distribution, it could be chi squared, it could have an extremely long tail, it could be from the Bernoulli distribution, it could be from a uniform distribution, it doesn't matter. And that's why this is important, because as engineers we don't have the knowledge of what the distribution is of the data coming in. We measure temperature on a distillation column, we measure flows, we measure values in our lab experiments. You measure just a few values from your lab experiment, five or six. You have no idea what distribution those values come from. Is your lab experiment generating values for you that are F distributed or uniform distributed? You do not have the money or time to do more experiments to, to figure that out. This central limit theorem is telling you, you don't need to worry about it. If you take those values, you sum them up and you calculate the mean, that X bar is going to be from the normal distribution or very likely from the normal distribution. So as engineers, this is very relevant for us, okay? Because we do not have knowledge of our source data set in, in almost all instances. So let me demonstrate that for you. Here's a slide where I'm throwing dice. The dice throw is an independent event. Let's accept that for now. I throw one throw, and that's going to be the histogram I get, a uniform distribution. So here I've thrown, um, I think, 500 times. I'm going to get 82, 83 throws of a 1, about the same for a 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now I throw those dice, that same dice, I throw it once, I throw it twice. Take those two values and compute the average of the two. Now I throw it another two times and compute the average of the two. Can throw it another two times and compute the average of the two. I do that 500 times. I'm going to get that distribution for those values. Notice now I have values at the lower bound. The smallest possible value I can get is a one. One plus one and a one divided by two is a, is a one. The largest value I still can get is a six. But I can get a one and a half. I can get a two, a two and a half as a value, etc. That's the distribution. I throw four times and I sum them up and divide three by four. I get that distribution. Six, eight, ten. Very quickly do I approach a normal distribution. Even after five throws, you very quickly get the value that is coming from the normal distribution. So the good rule of thumb is five throws will get you a number from the normal distribution. If I sum five values and compute their mean, that value is as if it comes from the normal distribution. Good, good rule of thumb to know. But there's this key criteria that those five values, or six or eight or however many I'm summing up, must be independent. Okay. So here, another definition by me, I, you can read all sorts of statistical definitions, but here's one that's more approachable. Two samples are independent if there's no possible relationship between them. So if I'm looking at the data coming from my batch reactor, here's yield one, here's yield two. Any way that those two yield values could be related to each other. Yeah, 
but if your usual protocol is just to empty the reactor, pull the next batch in and start up again, there's potential for lack of independence there. If your protocol is to properly clean that reactor two or three times and wash it through with caustic soda for two or three hours, then your independence assumption is met. Okay, so we have to think through our situation where we're measuring our data from, from taking from lab values. Those values are likely going to be independent if I, re if I do my experiments properly. If I measure temperature on the distillation column, and I take the temperature values five minutes apart, independent or not? Yes? No? Very likely not. The distillation column is a slow moving process. Values five minutes apart are not going to be independent of each other. Here's some other examples. I ask you to do a course evaluation, but I let you chat amongst yourselves, and while you're chatting, then you're filling it out. Am I getting, if there's 100 of you in the class, am I getting 100 independent data points? Not if you're talking with each other, you're exchanging ideas, or even prior to the class, or outside class during your lunch break, you talk about what an awful professor so-and-so is, or what a good professor so-and-so is. So the feedback we're getting in these evaluations are never independent. We're not getting 100 individual viewpoints from 100 people. If I record the snow falling in Hamilton for the last 30 days, those 30 snowfall values, independent or not? He says no. He says yes. He says maybe. Okay, so this one is there on the boundary and it's why I chose intentionally. Snowfall and rainfall, temperature, etc., on a daily basis are not independent. If it's hot today, it's likely to be warm tomorrow, and then maybe the next day it's slightly cooler. There's a relationship from day to day. But a daily time frame is enough for there still to be a change, but it's not long enough for there to be a total break. So you cannot guarantee anything. So maybe I guess those are over time. Like you have the same snowfall falling over the night. But then the next day there may still be some that, that weather system still hangs around and there'll be some residual snowfall the next day. That's exactly why it's not independent. If weather systems do not move so rapidly that they come and leave in a short time frame. So not independent. However, snowfall recorded on the third of January every year since nineteen seventy six. So take these 20, 30 data points, those are clearly independent. The weather from 3rd of January today is not going to be related at all to the weather 3rd of January next year. The impurity values in a batch reactor, we spoke about this one. There's another good example in the course notes on pump failures or um, failure of pressure relief systems. And why it's important that our pressure relief systems are independent and installed parallel to each other. So those of you that took 4N, you'll understand why that's important, but there's a, a statistical quantification we can make, and there's an example in the notes to go through. Okay, so if I ask you those questions that I had up there before, those are easy to answer, but you're not going to be in that fortunate position. What you're more likely going to be in the position is where you're going to go to your database, get a data set, and here's three examples of different data sets. Which one of those are independent? So these might measure the viscosity on the polymer that you're dealing with for the past 100 samples. You're going to calculate the average viscosity and you're going to say, well, Kevin told me I can use the central limit theorem, but I remember I need to guarantee independence. How the hell can I tell which one is independent? So which one is independent? Same as sample one. You're 
one of, a few of you are right, <laughs> but the idea here is you should not try to tell independence from the graph. You cannot tell independence from a plot. Here's why. Your eye cannot see independence. Right? We, can, we can show that through many studies that have looked at this. You cannot judge independence. The only way you can judge independence is doing a statistical test. The correct answer here is two. These data are synthetically generated, but sample one can easily be excluded as not being independent. We can only say how strongly related the values are to each other prior to it. If there's a trend up, it keeps going up. If there's a trend down, it keeps going down. So these data are correlated with each other. There is a relationship from one data point to the other. Many of you attempted to say sample three is independent because of the seeming in lack of relationship between the values. But there is, this one is the, one of these, this is the strongest uh, data set with the strongest amount of dependence in it. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, in general. Not every data point, but for the most part, there's what's called negative autocorrelation. The third data, the middle data set is the one with absolutely no independence, which the least of you chose. So the, the studies have shown that people will pick this as the data set that they think is independent. Let's take a look at how these data were generated. This is an important thing to understand because one thing we, we uh, shall change you of at MacMaster and all undergraduate schools is we do not teach you a course of time series analysis. So understanding data over time. It's a graduate level course at most universities, but this is an important time series concept to understand. So let's look at this. If I take a data, x of t, that's the value of x that I measure, the sample, at a particular time t. The most important time series model is what's called the autoregressive model. And that simply says x of t is equal to some coefficient b times x at t one sample prior to it. So it's the word autocorrelation means self-correlated. This is correlated to itself one sample shifted back in time, plus a random value AK. So AK is a value from the normal distribution, it's totally random, totally independent. So a data set that is independent, that shows no, no dependence in time, is a data set with B equal to zero. Okay. So B equal to zero <coughs> implies independence. There is no possible relationship with one data point to the other. Coming back to our definition of independence. B greater than zero is called positively correlated. And B less than zero is negatively correlated. The statistical test to assess for independence or lack of it is to plot uh, x of t minus 1 against x of t. And if I see it a slope, positive slope or negative slope, so for example if I see something like that, there's a, there's a measurable negative slope that's non-zero those data are negatively correlated with each other. So that's what this third sample looks like. If I had to plot x at t versus x at t minus 1, my data are negatively correlated with each other one step back in time. The most important time series model, the reason why I say that is for, the, uh, for most data systems you deal with, that will be the likely form of correlation that you see in the data. So AR, autoregressive time series models, are another one. <coughs> There's another important time series model, it's called the moving average model. We, I may, may talk about that in the later class as well. So those two models, AR and MA, are the two basic time series models. So sample two was generated with B equal to zero. Sample one was generated with B equals, um, in fact, so, uh, the numbers were for sample one, that is B equals to 0.4. Sample two, B was zero, and for sample three, e was equal to minus 26. So people
people have a tendency when there's negative correlation to assume that is not in, that, that that is independent. But your eye is lying to you. You cannot use your eye to judge statistics. If there's anything you learn from this class today is do not use your eye to judge any statistics. Use a computer with a proper statistical test function to, to, to make those decisions. So what I'll do next class is we'll, we'll uh, investigate and use those concepts for the normal distribution. But what I would like you to do is, we didn't get a chance to analyze the statistical table today. But I would like you to be quite clear on how to use that statistical table. This is the statistical table you would like you to use in the tests and exams. It's a version that I've created for this course that contains the essential information we need. Make sure you know how to read it. In other words, that's going to require you to recap what this normal distribution is and then to come and read the table. And if you are adventurous before the next class, try to do these next two exercises in the, in the notes. I'm determining the biological activity and I'm determining the yield from the basketball.